King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents the Wrestling Is Real Podcast because wrestling needs us. Time now for another Wrestling Is Real Podcast. King of Podcasts here with you. Thanks for being here. Listen to the shows you always do through all the major outlets for podcasts that are out there. We're going to talk about Apple, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, so many other places. That's where we are. We're all over the place. Ubiquitous, if you will. So thanks for being here. Listen to the show, as you always do. So glad to have you here. And tonight, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the normal run of WWE and AEW, where we are now, because things have once again gotten to another level, because where we are now is AEW, as I put in the opener for tonight, it just comes down to the fact that they have started an attitude era. A lot of things culminating into a certain faction, and then we see the particular reason why Impact Wrestling and AEW have joined forces. The alliance has been brought in here, and it's really interesting how it all came about. Very interesting. So we have that to go for everybody. And it's really a dynamic of what we saw on Monday night with what WWE was doing with their programming. And I didn't want to, I'm not, you know, taking that bashing at NXT's New York's New Year's Evil. Obviously, they had a pretty good night of action. Finn Balor retains the NXT title in action there over Cal Raleigh. So we got that. And so, okay. But still, so much going on after the Brody Lee tribute on AEW Dynamite tonight. Again, they're continuing the whole idea of a little bit of viral, you know, influencer ability when it comes to AEW when you bring Snoop Dogg. Now, regardless of what you think, Snoop Dogg is still, for whatever, whatever you want to say, there's a couple things that work hand in hand with this. So this is not just some random appearance with Snoop Dogg coming into play just because it's because he's trying to promote the Go Big Show. The guy obviously Snoop Dogg is under contract with Time Warner or Warner Media, excuse me, when it comes to what he was doing with the Joker's Wild and now what he's doing with the Go Big Show, which uh, attaches to Cody Rhodes, a nice little crossover for AW with this new show that comes up that they're trying to come promote. So that makes all the sense. And Snoop Dogg, doing a not a great frog splash, but obviously for a celebrity, he did do a frog splash and got a uh, on a wrestler tonight. Did that. That was to create virability. And there wasn't anything that really went overly viral, but I think some people are going to talk about it after the fact just because. It's still Snoop Dogg. He has some kind of re- relevance for pop culture, modern pop culture, the mainstream, if you will. So they're going to still talk about him a little bit here and there, and that's fine. So with that said, we have that. Not, that's okay. That's cool. And then we go ahead and say, okay, well, that's for you know the lighthearted. That's for you know the people that might be a little bit curious about the programming. That might get maybe a few people listening or actually viewing the program a little bit there. But then, of course, the end of the night, you come in with the real pure wrestling uh, format. The reason that you really watch professional wrestling is when you see matches like Kenny Omega versus Ray Phoenix and a drag out. This was just a hell of a match. What was it? 25 minutes ahead. That was a pay-per-view match they gave us tonight. And it was really amazing. So, uh, I mean, you know, I thought that the match at Triple Demania that Kenny Omega did with Laredo, Laredo Kid was actually really good. But this was, wow, another classic with Ray Phoenix. Just give Kenny Omega a luchador that's good, and he will he will just clear it up. Kenny Omega right now in this role, returning as a cleaner, and now beginning to be, you know, back in the helm of the Bullet Club. This is this is escalating Kenny Omega to the main event status. He is now a solidified main eventer. He's a star in that company. If he wasn't considered that before, he is now. And the elite have been broken up. And now the Young Bucks find relevance to go alliant, uh, going on alliance back with Kenny Omega. And the Good Brothers coming in tonight, invading AEW, if you will, but only to create an alliance all together. So the fact we're going to have AEW and Impact working together with this Bullet Club, Bullet Club Elite, once again. 
The only person that's not there is Finn Balor, right? Or AJ Styles. But either which way, this is one of the original formations. I think it was the original formation of the Elite Bullet Club. Here we are. We've made it. And this instantly gives credibility to the Good Brothers Having that attachment of Bullet Club once again, the purists of wrestling are going to appreciate this more than anything else. So you got that going for you. You have the addition of Don Callis now into the role as the invisible hand. You know, that's just good stuff. I mean, with all that put together, I'll tell you, one thing that got to be said too, the amount of work that uh, Chris Jericho and the announced team for AW did putting this over tonight, really good stuff. All in all, in all, good night for Dynamite. And that just tells you everything. That AEW has the attitude. AEW has the momentum. AEW now is doing all the right things. Again, it's still going to take them time, obviously, for more viewers to go ahead and jump on board. But you can already tell. Tonight might be a very good night for them as well in the ratings. We'll see how it works out. Obviously, they had a good competition with New Year's Evil tonight. Both shows on the Wednesday Night Wars putting out all out tonight. But again, we're seeing how the ratings have not changed much. We're still waiting to go and find out what happens next with NXT and AEW, this head-to-head, when they put really big shows together. I don't think there's going to be much to be said about how it will still continue. But again, across the board, AEW is pulling very good numbers. Now, they're not completely consistent every week. But again, we also know that they had issues with basketball and on we've had also things where you know just you know they've had a good deal with the nba playoffs several times but again when they've even had to get dropped off a little bit either move later in the night or on a saturday night they still have an audience that's pretty loyal and still pulls more than nxt does if it stays on its wednesday night but then on tuesday nights nxt can pull a good number as well we've seen that uh, as well so again, it's still nothing says more to the country that we still need NXT. It should stand alone as a Tuesday night show with AEW staying alone Wednesday nights. But again, WWE is still hesitant. They're not going to, they're going to just stay, stay fortified with leaving NXT there, even though it's hurting them in the long run. We know that for a fact, but so much going on on this show on dynamite tonight. That just it really it sets the trend for what they're going to be doing this year. When you look at things right now, Bullet Club reunites. You got the Snoop Dogs a uh, bit. You got John Moxley now reinvigorating his feud with Kenny Omega after the match with Ray Phoenix and that whole setup. It's all good stuff. They finished up, more or less looks like pretty much wrapped up the Abaddon and uh, Hikaru Shida, so we'll see who comes up next for her. But that's what AEW does. Inner Circle, you know, they've kind of worked on that, but everything's kind of just kind of just settled down a little bit. But that's what's going on. What good stuff they're putting out. I didn't get to see Wrestle Kingdom yet. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to get a chance to look at some of the matches and look what the, for the two nights were all about. That's what's going on. There's just so much being done right on AEW. And the people that are going to be upset about what AEW is doing is the loyalists that are seeing that the counterculture, the counter programming of AEW doing wrestling the way they want to do it, the way they want to do it without the boundaries, without all the rules and the clutches and the, and the walls that they felt like they were behind. Working for WWE, you could just see the difference. It feels free-flowing. It feels organic. It feels good. Sting working with Darby Allen. Just, there's just so many things right now that are interesting. So many different things to look at on that show in a two-hour span. And you ask yourself, how many things are there that really intrigue you on WWE programming in six hours? And that's a hard question to answer besides Roman Reigns I guess besides Sasha Banks or really what else maybe Drew McIntyre but there, that tells you a lot of things and here's the other thing that happened tonight or happened on Monday night 
seen the legends out there being used horribly, underused. The company doesn't understand that, you know, they could have really used the opportunity to have some of these legends go ahead and rub off really well on some of these stars. I, I guess you could say that Hulk Hogan kind of gave a little bit to Drew McIntyre, but really there's nothing there to kind of contribute that really brings anything out. I mean, there's nothing there. There's nothing that can get anybody motivated because when you look at the legends that you're happy to see for just a minute and then you say, oh, we're not going to have them next week. What are we going to be left with, left with next week? Ooh, I don't know. But that's where we're at. And yeah, sure, Keith Lee and Drew McIntyre had a very good match. But you knew that Keith Lee wasn't going to win. Pretty predictable. So a good glorified long main event. Yeah, but that's pretty much all it was. And did it help? No. I mean, well, it did so much for Raw. I mean, they did pull 2.1 million viewers. So the Legends and I did do something, but again, they're not going to get that audience again. They're not going to get back over 2 million like that. But the shot, shot booking, what else can they pull up their sleeve to do that? The one that it also had, the one thing that you could say they have going for them was that they did have Goldberg come out at the end of the night to challenge Gold, uh, Drew McIntyre at Royal Rumble. Okay. So you got that. And then you have to figure out if you're going to have opponents for Roman Reigns or Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania, who's going to be the guy? Who is it that you see out there that's really going to tell you, oh, this is the person that's going to stand out above the pack that we haven't buried, that we haven't hurt, that you think an instant Royal Rumble run will be enough to build that star up? Because even Drew McIntyre last year, I'm going to give credit where credit's due for this for this company. Listen, WWE last year, around this time, they did get Drew McIntyre. They were getting him ready. They were starting to do more with him. They let him get some personality out there. They let him open up a bit. He started getting noticed. They split him off from uh, Dolph Ziggler, who was just an anchor at that point, right? I mean, everybody looks at him. It's just like it's just... You're going to get held down if you're stuck with Dolph Ziggler. All due respect, he goes singles, he comes in, he's a face, and they give him the opportunity to be this unstoppable beast of a wrestler and a character. And then they put the moment in the Royal Rumble to get him where he takes out Brock Lesnar in the match, eliminates him. And then we get the match with Drew McIntyre and uh, Brock Lesnar so that Drew McIntyre gets the win and he's the one that takes care of that so again this time last year when we got the Brock Lesnar and Drew McIntyre I did give the credit and say hey they did the right thing Drew McIntyre got the rub from Brock Lesnar but again this is before Bruce Pritchard got thrown into the mix into the mix this is still I believe Paul Heyman and you know Eric Bischoff still being considered executive directors correct so where we are now we see this, and you got to say to yourself, they did successfully do something to get a star off the ground and build a star. Drew McIntyre, even at forty, at 35 years old, built a star, right? They did do that. At 35 years old, Drew McIntyre is in his prime. Sure, maybe he wasn't ready you know, 10, 12 years ago when they thought he was a chosen one, but they were not wrong about him at that time. And what happened was they were able to go ahead and tap back into that potential. And more importantly than anything else, they were able to go ahead and have Drew McIntyre after everything that happened to him, his own move in free agency and coming back and a fresh look gave him an opportunity to be perceived differently time away from being looked at as three man band being looked away as, you know, just kind of just a, a layman just being thrown out. You saw him back bigger, badder, jacked up, just having to look. And here we are 35 years old and he's got it. He is set to go. He's a star period. And now I think even the Roddy Piper feel with the kilt works for them as well. So that's all them that I had to go into, which is really good. But Drew McIntyre would have never gotten to where he was if he didn't get looked at 
somewhere else and get recognized. But how often does that happen where somebody comes back into the fold and gets a chance to get noticed again? That doesn't happen often. There's not that many people that could get that. Like, I mean, you know, we're never, it's never going to happen, but Cody Rhodes can never come back and become somebody significant like that in WWE. That would never happen. And I don't know what would be a better example. I mean, Bobby Lashley came around at the same time as well, but he hasn't been built up yet. And I don't know if they just don't feel like he could be champion. But what you could do with Bobby Lashley this time around, I mean, he is U.S. champion. You could have him dominate Royal Rumble, win it, and that's a guy you put up against Drew McIntyre. I mean, have we seen it before? Yes, but could you go back to that? Sure. But again, what opponents do we have? We already saw Randy Orton with him. That's enough. No fiend. I mean, who else do you have left? There's not much left. Lack of main eventers. Lack of people could be perceived as main eventers. There's no one on that raw roster right now that hasn't. And if you even would have considered taking Keith Lee and Riddle, even though they're new to the game, and even though they might have made their names, you know, busted their bones somewhere else, had their bump somewhere else, you have both of these guys under contract. You got them for the future. And these guys are veterans, not veterans under the WWE banner, but for the sake of the company, these guys should have been able to go ahead and move into the mix and go right on up. But they're not. I don't know what you do now. I don't know what you do to get him going forward. Now, what you could do, which I think they could also do right now, I don't know if it would be happening because of, you know, coming back from injury. But I love the idea of Karrion Cross being a surprise entered at Royal Rumble, and then he wins. And then you put him up against Drew McIntyre. Instant star made. You could totally do that and build that up and give us some time. Sure. That'd be a great way to introduce him. But right now, Keith Lee is just a, I mean, he's a speed bump. And it's unfortunate, but that's what he is. This company just didn't have anything ready for Keith Lee. He was picked up because somebody else would have taken him. You could just tell there's certain stars are doing that with too, because if somebody else, maybe some other company would be able to be successful with a big guy like him. And they're probably right. So why does WWE do this where they go ahead and pick up stars that they can't find a role for? They can't find anything to do with basking his glory. You know, you had it built in NXT. You can't figure it out. Riddle the same thing. You just can't figure it out. And this is what comes to. And also, when you're talking about guys that Bruce Pritchard, it's not his kind of guy. They're not his like favorite. To, if there's no favorites to him, if they're not some second generation star or something like that, I don't know what you do. But there's nothing there. You just kind of leave them out. There's nothing to go ahead and follow up on. These are major problems that, the, that this company's going through right now. You can't fill every night with legends. And we already know that the part-timers only work for only a little bit. And again, you only have so many that you can go back to. You're going to fork out the money for Brock Lesnar, or Ronda Rousey again. I mean, if that's what you have to do. And it's funny where the wrestling reserve newsletter put up a good point and said, you know what, when you're doing these shows, you have to take into account the fact that, uh, they are struggling with the fact that, you know, when you have people longing for the, for the past and they're only longing for the past because they feel that the current product is so underneath I mean, it's it's minuscule. There's just no momentum. There's nothing there, nothing to excite. It feels, you know, like the glory days are gone. They've done past. And that this company's incapable of bringing people back. We're going in the Royal Rumble. Miz still has the Money in the Bank briefcase. 
and they're not doing anything with it. Or I know AJ Styles had dealt with, uh, I believe, Drew McIntyre as well. Well, you know, AJ Styles now in the role with uh, Omos, it doesn't mean much to him. He's just sitting in the mid card as a notable star. He's not screwing anything up. He's just, you know, doing his job. He's basically, uh, AJ Styles is just a lunch pail. He's just lunch pail type worker, you know, blue collar type. Picks up his lunch pail, comes into work, does his stuff, and goes. That's it. Because he has to do, he doesn't do anything else. But they're not keeping him main event. He's been brought down. They're obviously going to do something with, with Charlotte Flair and Oscar when it comes to the uh, women's title. But again, we've seen that many times before. We're just going to go back to things over again. Charlotte Flair comes back, obviously with the, you know, the history with the Bruce Pitcher and Ric Flair. I'm, I'm pretty sure, and just that whole wrestling bubble, that circle. They're just going to go ahead and do what they're going to do with her, as always. And then just, you know, pair a couple of wrestlers together. Let's get Peyton Royce and Lacey Evans together. Lacey Evans has no identity whatsoever now. And taking Peyton Royce out of the Iconics, well, okay. Neither one of them are really doing anything. They're just wandering aimlessly right now in the ring. And also, what a horrible botch with Charlotte Flair because of Peyton Royce. That was just horrible. So the fact that Riddle beat Bobby Lashley in a non-title match, Will that mean anything afterwards? I think it's just, you know, it's just parody booking that we're getting right now. So Bobby Lashley gets just thrown in here, and he's, you know, for, again, for, for being U.S. champion, they're going to lose like that. Doesn't make him look strong for Royal Rumble. He just looks vulnerable. The company's incapable of having certain stars that can have winning streaks. They're just, they don't want to do it. They're ignorant and stubborn to that. They don't want to do it. Why they think that the parody booking will do well, why they just think that certain stars need to be above others, that you just can't have certain stars just become dominant. Can we have somebody that has an actual run that could actually motivate themselves and actually move up the card to elevate themselves to the main event? Because no one gets to do that. The booking doesn't allow it. The booking never allows it. Shannon Baszler has meant not much. You know, they dropped the, the tag titles. And, you know, dealing with Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose just feels really bad. And where Baszler's not even in the women's title picture, another person just wandering aimlessly that could be in any other company. Again, this is just talent that if some other company had, listen, a, I'll play it like this. AEW could do a lot with Shayna Baszler. Impact could do something a lot with Shayna Baszler. I mean, there's just a lot of other companies could do something with her. And WWE wants to just keep their things right here. They want to just keep everything right here and do nothing because they, they're just booking her badly. They don't know what to do with her. Again, it's another star they, have, they bought, they have on the roster. Listen, she's talent. Let's see what we can do with her. We'll just use it the way we use her. And that's it. And again, is that the best use of your money? They're not worrying about that. Again, the use of their money isn't how they're going to use them on the roster, how they're going to use them in the booking. It's the fact that it matters. They need to use them because they bought them in a corporate sense, right? You have these assets. You need to use them. You just can't have them sitting around. So when you have her here, you're saying, okay, let's go ahead and put her in the ring. Let's see what we can do with her. You know, Again, we're not going to try to use her for anything in particular because she's just not our style. She doesn't really fit our mold. She doesn't really go WWE style, whatever. Whatever excuse you might have, that's where they're going to go with. Going back to Randy Orton and Jeff Hardy, running out of ideas. I mean, how many times you want to put these guys together? And what else are you going to be doing? Oh, they're another non-title match and Hurt Business as tag champions. So the Hurt Business are completely destroyed. You're just damaging them by the likes of Riddle, who's been looking like like a clown character when he shouldn't be. Treated like a clown character, gets a win non-title. And then the same thing with the Hurt Business, having that faction look weak for what? Did we even see Retribution out tonight? No. 
again, I think that's what was for the legends. Those guys were held back. And for whatever reason, they didn't even bother to go go along with that faction, which has meant nothing. Retribution, you know, they got it. Okay, Ricochet, put them together, this and that. These stories mean nothing. These are so lower than mid-card. And what people need to understand, everybody understands this, but what you really need to go and look at is the fact that when I see Bruce Pritchard putting this together, they like the same way. The undercard means nothing. They're not, it's not even it's not even a consideration. There is main event, and then there's everything else to fill time. That's all they're doing, and that's because the talent they'd have is only being used for filling time and nothing else. And part of it is as well, we know that the creative is not allowed to be creative. But then again, they're also being brought on because they'll be able to go ahead and follow a certain direction. They're going to be facilitators. They're going to be cogs in the machine. They're not going to be able to do anything in the machine. They're just going to run the machine per directive of Vince McMahon under the operations day-to-day of Bruce Pritchard. What a wonderful experience that could be. I mean, the creators, that the, the, the people that really had wrestling minds and sense, that had really had good storylines, I mean, we don't have that now. Are they trying to build back up Sheamus? Maybe. Would it make a difference if Sheamus and Drew McIntyre become the next match we have at WrestleMania? Would that be the next one that comes up? Because, again, trying to go and build some excitement, some buzz for WrestleMania, you're not getting it right now. I don't know who you're going to get. Now, could Goldberg go and take on Roman Reigns eventually after all? I don't know. But who is your opponent for Roman Reigns? Like, I mean, you got to build that match right there. I don't know what you do with the rest of the WrestleMania card. That's going to be important. That's going to be interesting. Look, this is the time of year. We are in WrestleMania season now. Here we are. How on earth do you just keep going every year? I'm pointing out to WWE, every WrestleMania season, you can't take that four weeks or so in the off season and try to build something to lead up to WrestleMania season so that you're not waiting till four weeks before to start doing some things to get the Royal Rumble going. How many times do we need to go ahead and wait for them to go ahead and say, hey, you know, we'll figure something out. Four weeks away. Coming up four weeks away now. January 31st. And I don't see them having an idea of what they're going to do to get themselves up anywhere. I don't know. I mean, you look at the lead up to matches and feuds and things that are going on right now and the other companies leading up to their pay-per-views, major pay-per-views coming up. Impact Wrestling is going to have one coming up now, January 16th. And that's already a pretty loaded card right now. There's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, very good night. Old school rules match. You now have Tommy Dreamer, Rhino, Cousin Jake, Eric Young. Oh, it's me. Tommy Dreamer, Rhino, Cousin Jake versus Eric Young, Cody Diener, who they've now done a good job of starting to turn around to this new heel under Eric Young's tutelage. And Joe Doring, who's been this big heavy, that's been out there as well. Looks like something out of Urban Cowboy or something like that. Barbed Wire Massacre, so reinstituting the Eddie Edwards, Sammy Callahan feud, which that started off really well again, where Ken Shamrock is now brought into the mix, and Alicia Edwards is also brought into the mix. And they did a pretty good angle where they had Eddie Edwards tied up in barbed wire up against a fence where he was trying to go in and help Alicia escape for whatever reason she got caught in the cage there. And again, bat to the eye to go back to the original storyline of the legit shoot injury that Eddie Edwards sustained. So they went back to that again and you can go back to that. Those guys work great together. That'll be a hell of a match. Ethan page. I don't know if he's going to be on his way out. If that's the case, but he's going to do a thing where he's taking on this other alter ego, the karate man himself. They've done some decent work having the knockouts tag team title tournament put together. They're going to find the finals are going to be going on. Kira Hogan and Tasha Steeles versus Havoc, Havoc and Nevea. 
We're building up Tiana Bra- Diana Peraza versus Taya Valkyrie. That's going to be a hell of a match. I'd like to see where Taya Valkyrie comes back and be- becomes champion again. Good thing they bring her back to that mix right now because, you know, again, they've been doing things with her and they, you know, moved her off into some of their storylines and that was fine. But she should be back in that main event mix. They've done some good stuff with the X Division title. Manic, which is probably with TJP under the mask, versus Raju and Chris Bay. That'll be a good match together. But again, the lead up to the match, you know, six man tag to lead the night. AW World Champion, Kenny Omega. Good brothers, Impact World and uh, Impact Tag Team Champions, <laughs> the Bullet Club, you can say now, against Rich Swan, who is Impact Wrestling's World Champion and Motor City Machine Guns. That's good stuff. Pretty good stuff right there. That'll be a hell of a match. So I'm again. That is some real quality booking and some pretty good matches we're gonna have. At that show in a couple weeks. And of course, there'll be a, a post show I'll be doing for that right here at King of Podcasts. Or I, mean, I always keep saying that. WrestlingIsReal.com. God, I forgot to change the name of the uh, website. I actually got to you know do some stuff with that. So. But either which way, if you haven't gone to the website, WrestlingIsReal.com, you'll find the latest episodes. You'll find how to go ahead and follow the show. All the different social media outlets that I'm at. Go ahead and do that. And where you can subscribe and I hope you will subscribe to the show and you'll go ahead and let everybody know about it. Again, we've been on here since 2012 doing it and it's been great. And I really enjoy talking to you each and every week and just building this audience back up. And again, staying away from the noise of the wrestling podcasters. I'm now on an Island on my own. I, I got so tired of, the back and forth from the internet wrestling community that continues to be really, I mean, I just don't like the, the, the viciousness, I guess. I mean, there's just this, this real divide that goes on with people that just, they have a thing about AEW. And for those that get upset about what WWE does. And for me, I've done a little, a lot of unfollowing I'm doing on Twitter. I've been doing a lot more of that just because there's just a lot of people. I don't want to be seeing feeds from, and I just want to get caught up in the negativity. I just want to get out of it. And, you know, with some people's opinions I have, like I just kind of got away from it. And I'll tell you, I listen to no, no wrestling podcasters right now. All due respect to them. No, it's nothing against. But obviously we're seeing a re- revolution, you know, evolving of different things that are going on. But again, I'm not, I just kind of just, with social media right now, it's just nice to go in like, okay, I'll pull back. Because I'm just not, you know, I I got to stay constructive. I have to stay from away from people that are being ultra negative. And, you know, just, I don't know. I always get this thing where I just want to try to keep this in a more, I can't say intellectual level, but just something a little more constructive, a little more out there. And again, I'm not just doing this just to kind of pump myself up and, you know, make me into some kind of a character that's just most important. I hope you like what I do. Like I was just listening the other day to a the famous broadcast professional, the entrepreneur, one of the most amazing people in broadcasting ever, Dick Clark. He's one of my role models. He's one of the guys I look at that says, you know what? That's the way you do broadcasting. The guy did radio, did television, did movies. He is all around and was all around an amazing broadcaster, Hall of Famer, through and through, professional. And he just got it and also knew how to tap into a younger audience and knew how to go ahead and be at the tip of the spear, knew how to go ahead and engage with the younger audiences and always had a thought process of going forward. I cannot relish on the attitude era over and over. Like some people, I can't just go ahead and, you know, ma- ma- match. Oh, WrestleMania, this WrestleMania, that, that match. And this and that, I can't do that either. I want to look at the perspective, the whole spectrum of the whole thing of the TV companies and look at what they're doing and, and see the direction. And again, you you know, with the, me on this program, I talk about on a regular basis how I see the direction of wrestling going on on a regular basis. And I see AEW is finally starting to make a move up where they are pulling ahead. The momentum is in their direction. The numbers have to reflect 
that's going to be coming up. And again, they're getting their opportunity to go ahead and see how well they're going to be noticed and recognized to be helping out their fellow brands. Can the Go Big Show get off to a good start? Thanks to AW Dynamite. Does it get some help from the NBA? Or does the NBA get some help from them? I mean, you got to ask yourself. I mean, AW is getting all these opportunities. They're getting all these promotional opportunities. And they're doing their damnness to go and make that possible and to not waste the opportunities. AEW, to me, has learned and they have observed and they have researched and they have noticed the mistakes of the past and they are trying to do their damnedest to not make them. I think they do a really good job of that. Of course, we can be critical of AEW for certain things. Of course. Remember, there's certain matches that should be over on Dark, that should be on Dynamite. Well, but again, there's just so much I enjoy of it that, again, I just want a good, pleasurable, memorable, you know, enjoyable experience watching that show. And I get into it and I get involved and I like it. And it's not a boring show. It never is a boring show. It's different. It feels different than what WWE is doing. And I think that some of the other companies kind of follow along the AEW formula. Where I think I think Impact Wrestling in a little bit does try to do that. But Impact Wrestling does identify themselves differently. They do much more backstage stuff. And they're always trying to build their characters in that way. But again, with Impact Wrestling, they just don't have the star power. And some of their stars are using these kind of things with they're they're limited in their and like any acting or any kind of abilities to really put something out. But again, it's kind of hokey, but that's what makes it authentic. So I don't mind some of that so much. As for MLW Fusion, you know, MLW, again, limited resources, but they do good with the little they got. I can just see the Court Bauer is following that Paul Heyman feel of, you know. Hide the negatives, accentuate the positives, which he's doing. Again, Court Bauer is, in a way, what our ECW is. But again, I think what he does as well, I'll say it like this. I think MLW, I mean, it just if they have a better a better platform for themselves. And again, I know that we're going to do another pay-per-view, and they're going to have their Kings of Coliseum event that started up. I ain't got a chance to re- watch that yet, but I'm going to also catch that up. That was a... First hour of that episode they had this week, I got to go and catch up on. And if they get the chance to put on some more pay-per-views and hopefully continuation of getting their digital platform, more people to get their eyeballs on it because they're obviously trying to put themselves in a lot of different places to be, to be noticed, to be caught. You know, if you want to watch on Pluto TV, Fubo sports or what, or the zone, all these different places. Good for them. Because I think, Honestly, I feel like MLW is pulling ahead of Ring of Honor at this point. I think Ring of Honor has lost themselves. They're in the mix right now. Again, that's a deplete. That's that, it's also part of the depletion of the roster they had because WWE decided to use them as their place to pillage, and they've done quite a bit of damage to that roster. Now, it doesn't mean that. They don't have any stars over there. Of course they do. But again, Ring of Honor, I just feel like the, some of the stars they have, they just have them for a reason, just to just to have something there. But there's just not much there at all. I mean, you have mainstays like Jay Lethal and the Briscoes, and, and then you have some stars that have been around for a while that you're definitely noticing. There's Vinny, and then there's, or it's to be Vincent and Matt Taven and things like that. But again, it's a hodgepodge. It's a it's it's a band of misfits. I feel like in some cases, because I mean, yeah, they put together. Uh, you know, they have one faction, kind of sorta, but there's really nothing much else. Like there's not much to build off of. I mean, again, Final Battle wasn't a bad show. It wasn't a show that I was like over the top. Like, wow, this is amazing. I thought it was good, but again. They are bringing out some stars, but I just think that some of the types of stars they have and the booking they're able to do is limited. And there's nobody that really, I mean, Roosh is awesome. 
Bandito is very good. Dragon Lee is very good. But again, I'm just thinking there's just not much there. The Japanese capacity is not there for them either. And then again, nobody's taking advantage of that. And Ring of Water doing it on its own and picking up a couple of luchadors and a couple of other stars for some different styles and all. I think MLW does just does, does a better job. And obviously Ring of Honor, where MLW has a relationship with AAA and they are working in a different direction. Like I just feel like with MLW, it is pulling ahead of Ring of Honor. And then I also feel like where Ring of Honor and NWA are also kind of just like neck and neck right now. Because when you look at the talent, and, and this is where I don't understand as well, why Ring of Honor and NWA, now where that all fell apart. Because I'll tell you, those two would have needed each other. And what's happening now instead is AEW's working with NWA. I mean, not so much, again, but again, it's just, it's just these strategic alliances that AEW does that also helps them out. They're doing the things that Ring of Honor did good a couple of years ago with that New Japan relationship because, you know, Ring of Honor, New Japan, they greatly benefit. I mean, Ring of Honor greatly, uh, greatly benefited from all that was going on. And now, I don't know if the New Japan crowd is big into seeing the Briscoes or Jay Lethal or whatnot. And again, some of the stars they had, you know, some stars moved over. I'll tell you, Ring of Honor is badly missing Jay White. You know I mean? There's there's just some of the stars they could have had and they missed out on. And, you know, I'll tell you, with Court Bauer, he's doing the right thing, trying to do some relationships here and there with AAA. And I know he had some stuff going on with uh, Japan. I forget it was um, Pro Wrestling Noah, I think it was. I forget who they were working with over there to bring some stars over. But again, those relationships will start fostering again. I'm sure Court Bauer is going to be able to do that. But AW, or the other TV promotions, is doing that. But strategically, to help in the women's division, to let the NWA women's champion work is wonderful. I love that. So Serena Deeb, Ty Conte, that actually should be a pretty good match coming up next week. But again, NWA, you know, but again, they are just they're utilizing good stuff. And also because NWA has good women's champions. Again, Thunder Rosa, fantastic. As a result, Thunder Rosa now working with NW or the AW. And in some capacity, I don't know if she gets to work both companies or whatnot, but again, there's always some other people that NWA has on their roster. Yeah, of course they've come from other companies, but they're still very popular and talented. I mean, when we looked at the NWA show shockwave again, you're looking at Nick Aldis. It was just, again, stand off, a standout NWA. I feel like has a bit of a better roster than ring of honor does now. And that's just because Ring of Honor, it's not like it doesn't have a good roster, but it's just not well developed. Nick Aldis, Eli Drake, you know, James Storm, and you're looking at um Aaron Stevens, a question mark, like all that kind of stuff going on. It just there's a lot there. Even Eli Drake, to me, uh, Elijah Burke, excuse me. Even him coming out as Pope, like you're just better established. And for the fact that those kind of stars would not be working in Ring of Honor right now, those two should be working with each other and helping each other out. But again, there was some kind of, you know, something happened there. And Ring of Honor, I don't know, they're just not playing nice. That whole Sinclair relationship's not working well. That's what it looks like on this end. Sure, they brought back Mike Bennett. That's good. They let go of Marty Skrull. He's out. I don't know where Marty Skrull goes at this point. But again, Ring of Honor has, they need some momentum. Like for them this year to evaluate them, they need some help. I don't know where they're going to get that from, but they have a little bit of staleness in their roster. You know, there was a time where Dan- Dalton Castle was a big deal. Now he's not. I don't know if Vincent's going to be the answer. Roosh has been a bit of a, I don't know, I've always felt kind of weird when Roosh decided to go and leave. MLW and go right to Ring of Honor. I was always kind of a little weary about that. And then again, Rush and Bandito also with a relationship with CMLL and kind of having that kind of fall apart. Like Ring of Honor didn't look good right there. And then Ring of Honor also taking a hit now because of Marty Skrull. And now, you know, after all this time, he was still on the roster after the whole time's up deal. 
And now he's out. There's just a lot of things to be answered about that. So they're hurting. They're hurting badly right now. So getting back to the point, Impact Wrestling, they're the kind of people right now that have so much going on with that show to build up. And that there's excitement. There is momentum behind that. And Impact Wrestling, with this relationship right now with the Bullet Club and with AEW, they're going to get a rub off of it. I don't know if it's going to be enough for them to get anything from, but they're getting something from it. Obviously, we're seeing the Impact ratings coming up a little bit. They're getting back up into the numbers they had when they were on Destination America, right? At least it looks like it is. So they were getting some good numbers when it comes to their viewership prior to the best of episodes they ran for the last two weeks because they were pulling over 200,000 viewers with Kenny Omega's appearances on the show at the, uh, when they were hitting on what was it? December 3rd and December 10th, but then 17th and 24th, or sorry, what was it? Uh, sorry, 15th and 22nd. That's what it was. So second, uh, for the first two weeks of December, they were doing pretty well, getting some numbers, had a little drop off for what they were doing. But again, their numbers are now considerable. At least they're getting now on the map once again. They're getting back on the map once again. And I can't say that for much for others. Again, you know, being put on Pursuit Channel, looks like they were just lost in the woods, literally, you know, being on a hunting channel. But being on Access TV, they're actually building some buzz right now. And Access TV, to the credit, and to the folks at Fight Network, you know, and Anthem, they are now going to do the Wrestle Week to kind of build up Hard to Kill. That should help out a bit. So people are going to be watching that. And again, Bullet Club, people are going to watch that match. So some more eyeballs are going to impact wrestling as a result. And that's for a tape show, by the way. That's a tape show and it's working out. But again, tape show without an audience to spoil. Right? We don't have that either. I don't think we get any of those kind of spoilers. So that helps out a lot. So let me go and bring up the whole idea of where impact wrestling and AEW are together. Scott Demore. Got interviewed by Sports Illustrated and then Justin Barrasso and asking about the crossover with AEW. So in the story, here's what we got. When brought up about Kenny Omega bringing an incredible amount of excitement to impact and he's in the main event of the Hard to Kill pay-per-view. Hard to Kill is not a one-man show. The foundation of impact has been rebuilt over the past couple of years. Genuine interest in talent like Ace Austin. By the way, where's Ace Austin been? He's been out for a while, right? Has he been hurt? Rich Swan, Deanna Perrazzo, the Motor City Machine Guns. Is that the key for you having Omega help shine a brighter spotlight on your talent? And Scott Demore said, well, a big heart part of it is what you just hit on. Kenny is a forward thinker. He doesn't think of the confines of traditional wrestling. It's the same with the Young Bucks and Tony Khan. They're all forward thinkers. And we are very proud of what we're building at Impact Wrestling. Since Anthem came in, the goal has always been the long term. You can't do this in a day, a week, a month, or a year. Incrementally, we've tried to get better, brick by brick. So, yes, this is a chance for us to show off our talent. This isn't just a chance to see Kenny Omega. It's, again, to see the reuniting with Carl Anderson and Doc Gallows. Then they go to more important building blocks for Impact, including Jordan Grace, the North and Taya Valkyrie. And Scott Demore's asked about assessing the current roster against where it's been from previous years. He says, I'll compare this roster to the roster that was here when I got here. The knockouts have grown in size and quality, and we have talent that takes pride in great performances and efforts. I'm really proud of them. 2020 was really tough, but our talent has continued to go out and put on a great product. Now, look at the people you mentioned. You know, again, you could try to buy success, and that can't be achieved to a certain level. But for us, the long-term success is built on finding talent that hasn't had that national stage. You look at Chris Bay, the North, they were able to build an even bigger platform here. Ace Austin, another great example. Deanna Perrazzo already had a great resume, but maybe wasn't clicking where she was. Quite clicking. We wanted to give her an environment where she could develop, grow, and prosper. And to think, hey, I got to tell you, there's going to be something to be said about where WWE, when they let let go of some of that talent, 
of course, there's certain talent they didn't really pay too much attention to. You know, Impact Wrestling hasn't been able to do much with some of the stars they brought on board that have been long stays of WWE when it comes to Heath or Brian Myers, right? So that hasn't happened much there. But what they have done is Good Brothers now is going to get a, get a, get a great rub off the Bullet Club faction. That's going to help them greatly. Deanna Perrazzo is doing much better here. Doing much better here. Can't say so much about, you know, uh, to Neil Dashwood, not so much. I mean, she's kind of there, but she's definitely in the mix. But, you know, I think I don't know if there's just maybe just kind of a bit of a plateau for her, and that's pretty much what been it, either as Emma or as, as uh, to Neil Dashwood here, a uh, real name. And then Scott DeMorse asked about the partnership with AEW. Will we see more of the crossovers? A meaning pinning Motor City Machine Guns against the Young Bucks, headlining a pay-per-view. Well, I know we had that before as Generation Me when Young Bucks were around, so to see him back once again. Now, the Bucks have teased the return of Impact. I'll keep saying this. The door is always open. I worked with them briefly when they were first here. They were great then. They were great in Japan. They're great people. They revolutionized the wrestling business and the way it looks. There's a bond that connects the Young Bucks and the Motor City Machine Guns. So seeing them hook up one more time as a dream match, it would be unbelievable and mostly rewarding for wrestling fans. Then the questions asked by Justin Barrasso about the what, what AEW has to gain from Impact as a partnership. The whole idea was that Scott DeMore says, I'm very happy we get to do some crossover stuff with them. Often in wrestling, the question is, why would we work with someone else? This has put eyeballs on both companies. We're very appreciative. And I think it's added a buzz for both shows. And the collaboration on talent level creates the potential for a lot of fresh matchups. But it's going to be a great time to be a wrestling fan and a great time to be in the wrestling business. And again, the momentum and everybody... All they want, if they want to go and continue to go ahead and crap on what's going on with what AEW and Impact Wrestling are doing together, whatever, I get it. You know, people might be upset about it, but I don't think there's anything bad about this at all. I've really enjoyed the experience of seeing AEW and Impact working well together and making something, working together, and finding some common ground to go and make some great wrestling. Again, there's no jealousy. There's no selfishness right now. It's very selfless of them. For WWE right now, I hate to say it, this is actually would be something that would be helpful to them if WWE would do something where they would work with another promotion, which they did before. We know that. We did it with ECW. And they did that at a bad time. And Vince McMahon at the time did feel that way. Why not now? It was just a thought. I mean, again, the wrestling promoter in Vince McMahon would consider doing a little bit of cross promotion with another brand. But again, I mean, you know, at this point, WWE is in such a high level that to be considered to work with anybody else, you know, they, they can't be looked at. That's their problem. It's an inferiority complex. That's the word anybody else anyone else they work with is inferior and also why do they need to do that when they have the nxt brand but they fail with the nxt brand not the nxt brand itself a standalone it 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 does well but for the purpose of what wwe needs and the performance center it's not working and it's not because the system's not right what Triple H and the team's done uh, done down there, William Regan and others, they've done a good job. There's no reason why that pipeline should not be going through with all those resources coming in. Maybe it's too many. And remember, they're just getting other stars ready to go somewhere else. But like, if you can't, you can't, you know, bear the fruit of the works that you've done with all this talent and bring them up. I mean, you look at the story about fighting for my family and Paige and that performance center and where things went to get over where they are here, right? Same thing. I mean, the build up to that star and where she was and where she is, we don't have that right now.
And, you know, it's it's amazing because there's so much good talent that the company's brought out. When I even think about the fact of the stars that remember we had, you know, not that long ago, especially on women's side. Remember what we, even before we had the, uh, before we had the uh, the four horsewomen, right? The, the, you know, with Charlotte and Sasha and Bailey and Becky Lynch, we did have Paige. We had AJ Lee and we just had, you know, still some good stars back there. And, and just even then, you had the like CM Punk in the day, and so much more. There's just so much missing right now. The momentum is just nothing fills momentum wise. Drew McIntyre, yes. Roman Reigns, sure. So you got those champions right now, but you have no, nobody you have ready to go to build up. And this is where the company doesn't bother thinking about that. And then I say, well, okay, we need to find somebody now. Royal Rumble time. We got to find an opponent. How many times have they gone to a part timer? When CM Punk had held the belt, what was it four hundred sixty four days? Right around the Rock and John Cena. Oh, let, let's get CM Punk and the Rock together. Make sure Rock has the title. Or Brock Lesnar. Oh, okay, Brock Lesnar's working right now. He's part timer. But then we get Goldberg over part timer. Let's get the part timers in. This cannot continue. There is nobody else left. Look at the legends you have now. Look at how old they're looking now. You know how bad it looked to see Big Show having the guns just see sit it down? I know he could get up. Maybe he could move around. But again, that Mark Henry looking older now and looking like he just, again, but again, he can't keep that weight that he had. He's getting older. You can see a little more white in his, uh, in his beard. And he has the injury right now, so he had to go and like be out in that little little uh, leg cart. Like that looks bad. It's not in the best light to see Mark Henry, the world's strongest man, looking kind of frail on TV. I mean, all that didn't look good. I mean, who did look good were the women. Mickey James looked amazing. Tori Wilson looked amazing. Melina looked amazing. Like, there's that. Okay. But, I mean, when you look at some of the stars they brought back over, oh, they're missing, man. And they only had so many legends they could bring over. It's pretty rough for them. I don't know what you do next. But again, you just look at the whole spectrum. The legends they brought over, and they're going to have to go after people that they consider legends as well. I mean, does Edge come back at some point and help me build things out? I don't know. I mean, are you waiting for people to come back to kind of put a little bit of uh, a little bit of hope? I don't know. But think of all those little different things right there. Those little different factors. We're in WrestleMania season now, and we come back to this every January. Do we ever get anywhere? Does this company? ever changes its its uh, style do we, can we expect anything less than what they already give us we come to this point they never prepare the off season did nothing it's what they do we could talk about this or we could talk about whatever of the issues that are going on with this company, which other people do on their other podcasts, but I can only do so much of this. I have a threshold. That's why I have to talk about other companies because there is great wrestling out there. And I said that all through 2020. And I've been saying that for years. And again, seeing the companies that came back up. A couple of years ago, seeing AEW announcing the formation of their company three years ago to this point, I mean, all that still is, it's grateful to have, you know? Remember, we're now into year three of the company. Keep this milestone in front. Remember, January 1st, New Year's Eve 2019. That's when this company got founded, AW. And how quickly did they get this going? October 2019 to now, look at how quickly the show has grown. 
I mean, it really has. It's been exponentially fast. There's not a lot of companies you've ever seen with a promotion that come all of a sudden and just go boom like that. But they are. It's amazing what they've done so far. They have the backing. They're being managed well. I don't hear them having any issues right now when it comes to putting the show together and making it successful. I mean, it's just kicking. It's clicking right now. And I'm telling you, I, I probably see the people like Eric Bischoff and the Crockett's and all, and they just, man, I wish we would have run it that way. But they are, that's a well-managed, well-old machine right now, AEW. It really is. And man, I don't even take time to watch the dark episodes, and I should. Because that would be pretty, I'm pretty sure they're pretty interesting. I remember when I was watching the dark all the time, but it is a little bit um, uh, much to go ahead and keep up on, on that because those shows are long, and there's a lot of matches to go through. But again, there's a lot of content they're putting out. They still have another show ready to be put together. They have to start up. But they're not living off the elite. They have built stars in the short amount of time. And they have some young stars on the rise. I can't say that for WWE right now. Can you? Think about it. With the addition of certain stars they have, with the accompaniment of legends and that's the other thing that brian alvarez and david Meltzer talked about the way the legends are used on AEW are so much better than what the wwe does right and remember it's not as if the legends that are brought on doing you know management work are getting a whole lot of time and a whole lot of presence like they're not even coming out every week i don't we only see tully blanchard or arn anderson or vicky guerrero or Jake the St. Roberts every week talking on TV? No. And they're shuffling wrestlers out. Murder Hawk, we haven't seen much of. We haven't seen much of Nala Rose. We don't see him all the time. Sean Spears, we don't see all the time. FTR, we don't see all the time. Like they are back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's not the same people on TV each and every week. And they have factions upon factions. And a lot of great factions, by the way. Eddie Kingston's faction with Butcher Blade and the Bunny, fantastic. I love it. You know, Team Taz, another great faction. Love it. Inner Circle and now Bullet Club Elite back together. I mean, there's just so much going on. And again, younger stars we're talking about. MJF, Darby Allen, Orange Cassidy. Man, they are building stars over there. That's a star-making machine. And what is their training route? Dark. Literally, AEW Dark is their training ground. Developmental system. That's it. And they're just picking up stars that already have a little bit of, already had the wherewithal, and they're just helping to build them up. It's just like that. They make it look so simple now. And for a corporate entity like WWE that doesn't figure it out with all the millions of dollars they have, all the resources they have in that performance center, all the staff and creative talent and resources they have, and they're coming up so short. Why don't they understand that? Well, I don't know. They don't. NFC TakeOver is going to be set up for Valentine's Day 2021. That's cool. AW Revolution, February, this me is uh, February 27th, and we're already starting to see the seeds being planted. Another rematch, John Moxley and Kenny Omega, most likely. Obviously, Darby Allen's going to have to deal with things when it comes to defending the TNT title. That's going to be down the line. And Team Taz has something to do with it. Sting being involved, we know that too. There's just so much there. So much going on. New Year's Smash, great. I mean, there's just so much to be going on. The excitement is there. AW has all the momentum. 
Embrace the suck. WWE, embrace the suck. You guys, you need to find your momentum back. You got to go find your mojo and get it back. The attitude era is there in AEW. They're feeling it. And they give you the wrestling. They give you the promos. They give you the storylines. They give you the arcs. They give you it all. It's complete. It's all there in one shot. One perfect package. And I'm sure next week I'm going to have to go and repeat the same thing over again in some other way, shape, or form. Another style. But again, these are the rants I come up with. This is what I come up with every week. Sometimes I don't know what I'm going to talk about until I go and open up the mic. And honestly, I was watching AEW tonight. And I was thinking, all right, what am I going to talk about this week? Put together the graphic real quick. I'm like, all right, I'll do that before we get to the end of the show. I'm doing that in between Kenny Omega and Ray Phoenix. I finish it up. I get it ready. Set it up for both formats. So I can put it up on the YouTube channel and for the, uh, the speaker feed. And then I said, okay, title it. All right. That's what I'm going to go with right there. Done. Sometimes it's just organic like that. Okay. We're going to leave it there. Thank you for listening to the show. Subscribing as you always do. So thankful for all of you. Being here. Another year. Obviously, we'll know a great year for wrestling. We already know that. And again, this is the storyline for the year in professional wrestling. AEW has established an attitude era. WWE has a couple of pieces right in their main event, but they're lacking the opponents. And they're lacking so much more. It's inexcusable. There's no reason why they should have this happening to them. I don't know what they're thinking. But again, a corporate company can harm and hurt creative. And they're doing it right now. And I think that things are going to be building back up. Obviously, seeing the return of MLW, Ring of Honor's back. Hopefully, they can build their momentum back up. NWA, they're going to bring back power. That'll be really uh, helpful for people to come and see them coming back. So much more. Just read something about, uh, I think it was um, a new uh, more English language uh, programming coming up for New Japan, things like that. So much more. We're going to leave it there. Come back next week for another Wrestling Zero podcast because wrestling needs us. Thank you for listening to the Wrestling is Real podcast. Follow the King of Podcasts on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and on Facebook at Wrestling Is Real. Subscribe to the Wrestling Is Real podcast through all major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Spreaker, and iHeartRadio. You can also look for episodes on his YouTube channel, youtube.com slash J-B-R-A-S-C-O. Nine five one. You can find all this information and more by going to the website wrestlingisreal.com.